speak to you this morning about look before they leap. Look before they leap. Before this is over, you will understand what I mean by that, but I want us to go back over these past few months as I've been preaching and teaching about how that Jesus brought the disciples to that culminating moment when he was to be crucified. And even though they tried to tell him, no, 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 you can't do that. Jesus said, don't you understand? For this very reason came I into this world. This is why I came. I came to die. I came to give my life. I came to pay this price for the ransom of many. I came to seek and to save that which is life lost. I came to lay down my life. That's what I came for. And how that nothing took him by surprise. How that Pilate even spoke to Jesus and said, Don't you understand? I hold your life in my hand. I can either cause you to live or cause you to die. And Jesus is like, Well, not really. You're only able to do what my Father allows you to do, and you don't even know, but God is in control of what you're doing at this point. You don't even know it or realize it. And what's going to happen is going to happen because God has ordained it. Nothing took him by surprise. Go with me to Matthew chapter 26 and verse 31 through 32. Jesus was about to be arrested... And, and, and after Jesus was crucified and raised from the dead, since Easter we've been talking about the progress or the process to Pentecost, how that he still wasn't done with his disciples. And I want you to understand something. When you come to the cross, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, he pays for your sins through the resurrection, redeems you and gives you everlasting life He's not done with you. He's not done yet. And there's a process that God takes us through to bring us to salvation. And then after that salvation, there's a process that God takes us through to move us into His power and His manifestation in our life, through our life, and to the world. Now we find in Matthew 26, Jesus is about to be arrested and He says... This very night you will fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. We preached about that. We talked about how that, you know, in the scriptures, Jesus had already told them that after I die, I'm going to meet you. He even told them where he was going to meet them. But they instead were huddling in a room, afraid of the authorities, scared that they would be found. And God had to send messages to them to say, Hey, I told you I would be raised. I am raised. I told you that I would meet you in Galilee. Get out of here and go to where I told you I would meet you. We... Look at Mark chapter 16 and verse 6 through 7. He said, don't be alarmed. He said, you are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene. These are the angels in the tomb who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But then he tells the ladies, but go tell his disciples and Peter. And that's very specific. And Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Now, here's the thing. I want you to think about this for a moment. He said, and Peter, not because, and Peter's really important and you need to make sure he's here because he's the really big guy. No, because I need you to specifically tell Peter because he's the one who's struggling the most with his failure. I, I want to I run that one by you again. You see, sometimes we think that God's focus is only on the successful, only on the powerful, only on the ones that have done great things. But here Jesus adds, and Peter, because Peter was the one who was most struggling with his failure and what had just happened. So God looks at your life and he has this message and he says, look, I have plans to meet you. I have plans to do things in your life. And you've got to understand, this was after he was crucified and raised from the dead. And so Jesus, let's go to Acts chapter, uh, let's go to Acts chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. After his suffering, 
He showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. You see, from the, from the Passover to Pentecost was 50 days. 50 days. Next Sunday is going to be Pentecost Sunday. So from Easter to Pentecost Sunday is 50 days. 40 of those days, Jesus spent further teaching and instructing his disciples. Now, he had just been teaching them for three years. Why did he have to then spend another 40 days with them? Because understand this, and these are a couple little short sermons I'm just throwing in there as bonuses. Because sometimes we can't understand what God is telling us until we have gone through that work of grace. And so once we have gone through that work of grace, that's when we can really begin to understand what God is trying to say, what His Scriptures are saying, and we comprehend and we understand because at this point now we have the Holy Spirit living in us. We find in John 20 that after He met with Him, He breathed on them and He gave them the Holy Spirit to dwell in them. We know that's the indwelling presence. That's the salvation. That's when we get saved. The presence of Jesus comes and lives in us. We know this out of Romans, even in chapter 6. And when we have the Spirit of God in us, we are His. And so the Spirit of God is dwelling in you. So if you are here today and you have not experienced that work of grace, there's things God cannot help you understand until that takes place. If you're watching my live feed or recording, you can't have it before you have it. You can't understand it till you have it. So you're wanting God, I want to understand it, before I have it, but you can't understand it until you have it. And then, <laughs> that's a message for somebody. You're wanting it all explained, and the only way you can ever be explained is to experience it, and then you'll understand it. Then it begins to make sense. And you see, for 40 days, God put all the pieces together. And he said, you see, I know y'all didn't understand. Now you have, you have seen and you do understand exactly what I'm up to and how this is happening. But then in Acts chapter 1... We find he appeared to them over a period of 40 days, spoke about the kingdom of God, and on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Now, there, that's that little statement right there. I want you to look with me. While he was eating with them, he gave them this command. You say, what is that important? Why is that important? Spirits don't eat. The risen, living Christ... The risen, living Christ, who was dead but is now alive, is eating with them. That's another sermon just thrown in there. But anyway, he said, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You heard me share earlier today how that what they're discovering is they have scientifically tested people's brains when they're speaking in tongues. And you know what they discovered? That when someone is under the unction of the Holy Spirit and speaking as the Spirit gives them the utterance, the part of the brain that forms and makes speech happen suddenly goes quiet. And another part of the brain that experiences emotions and feeling, that part of the brain energizes the part of the brain that works through our reasoning and our mind and our understanding, that part of the brain goes silent. It goes still. You see, the Bible doesn't lie when it says they spake as the Spirit gave them the utterance. There's a part of your brain that is designed to connect with the Spirit of God. you got a Holy Ghost antenna up there. But guess what? Until you got it, it don't work. I know it's not good English. It just sounds better. It doesn't function. I, it doesn't work. I, have y'all noticed this? That when, when, when a piece of electrical equipment doesn't have any power, it doesn't work. So you see, it's there and it's ready. And when you believe in Christ and He gives you His Holy Spirit, suddenly that Spirit 
energizes that part of the brain that was designed for his spirit to dwell in and suddenly, bingo, it works. So he said, but don't you leave until you get this gift of the Holy Spirit. And here's the amazing thing that they found in these studies that all of these substitute drugs and all this stuff that they give guys or ladies to kind of combat the effect of the drugs on their life. The problem is those drugs create reactions that you have to come off of, but they've discovered that the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the fullness and the experiences of the power of the Holy Spirit that y'all are having down here around this altar and in the presence of God, you know what it does? It does in your brain what those chemicals try to do in your brain, but the good part is there's a reaction to this too, but it's not a withdrawal, it's a drawn to Jesus Christ and it transforms and changes your life. And I love how science is. We don't know how it works, but we know it's not God. You don't know what it is. You don't know how it happens. How do you know it ain't God? Because you're Godless. But if we could get it turned on in there and your little antenna would work, you would understand, yes, it is God. But anyway, don't you leave. Now, I love this. He says, don't leave until you've got it which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to say, so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, you're still at it, guys. You're still trying to look at this from an earthly perspective. Are you going to come? Are you going to sit on the throne? Are we going to have a kingdom? It's not that kind of kingdom. He said, No. And it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by His own authority, but but there's something you can do. I can't explain everything about the universe to you. I can't explain everything about the brain to you. Neither can science. Science harnesses electricity, but they have no idea why it happens. Well, they, yeah, because, I mean, when you take, you know, a magnet and you spin it around metal, it causes the little uh, ingredients in an atom to vibrate, and when it does, it creates electricity. Well, why does that happen? Why does an atom stay together? Well, because, the, you know, the proton, the neutron, the electron, all they, they're attracted. Well, why are they attracted to each other? Why do they stick together like they do? And why, if you tear them apart, it'll blow this whole city up? Some so tiny, you need an electron and a microscope to see it, but you tear it apart, it'll blow the city up. Why? Because there's a God. Okay, so there's stuff I can't explain to you, but when the Holy Spirit comes, something happens. He said, but I'll tell you what you can do. Instead of trying to understand all the kingdom and everything and how it all works and when it's going to happen and all that, how about you do this? How about you go get in a room somewhere? How about you pray? How about you open your heart to God? How about you let the Holy Spirit come and do something that none of your understanding can do? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. I I look. Now, so Jesus had this plan. God and Jesus had this plan and the Holy Spirit about how all this was going to happen, and that God was going to use the church to be a witness in this day and time of the world from then till now. And he had all this plan and this purpose. Now I want you to go with me to Mark chapter 16, and I want you to see this plan begin to take place. In Mark chapter 16, in verses 14 through 20, later Jesus appeared to the leaven as they were eating. But he rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. I know I'm digressing a little bit, but I want you to understand how all this is working together. Mark records, he said to them, this is after his resurrection, meeting with his disciples. And he says, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. And whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on the sick people and they will get well. Malinomas will disappear because of this. 
Cancers will disappear because of this. Bones will be healed. Miracles will happen because of this. These signs will follow the folks who have learned to tap into this and have received what God wants to give them. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Notice this prepositional construction. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. After he told them what to do, they went and did it. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by signs that accompanied it. The problem with many of us, the reason God is not moving in miraculous ways in our life is because we're not doing what He told us to do. We're not being what He told us to be. So God can't do what He wants to do. We're not in the right place. We're not doing the right things. We're not being the right people. And because of it, God is limited because He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He didn't say, I will build your church in whatever form of that that you want. No, I will build my church. So when we start being His church, He'll start doing His stuff. Now we go to His church. Let's go to the book of Acts. Let's go to his church. Once he's not only taught them, died, rose from the dead, appeared to them, taught them for 40 years, and Pentecost has happened in Acts chapter 2, and they got what he told them they were going to get, and suddenly what he said they were going to do started happening because they got what he said they were going to get. Hope y'all are catching that connection. Because I'm going to pound it into your brain in the sermon. In Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. There were multiple periods of time when they would pray in the daytime and they dedicated, we find in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 45, they dedicated themselves to prayer and the apostles' doctrine and to fellowship. And they broke their bread with gladness from house to house. They'd eat, break their bread in gladness and they shared all their possessions. The end of chapter 2. And we find here's chapter 3 picking up. They're still praying. They're still believing. They're being the body of Christ. Now, a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. And when he was put every day, very important, when he was put every day, when he was put every day, if he's put there every day, I just got back from Jerusalem, and guess what? If there's a guy who's been put there every day, Although those, it's a big set of steps that goes into the temple and that entry into the temple. Let me tell you something. There's no way someone could be there every day and I'm going in and out of the temple all the time and me not see him. Now here's, a very, here's another message I'm going to throw in there. There's people you have seen every day and it's never dawned on you that you might have a divine encounter with them that could change their life and rock their world if you'll just be what God wants you to be. That's foreshadowing. Now, and he was put there every day in the temple courts. People you run into every day. People you rub shoulders with every day. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. What's exciting to me is that there are a bunch of guys who have come through Mercy House Adult and Teen Challenge who walked up to this corner asking us for money, but guess what? God gave them such, so much greater than just a few dollars to go get something to eat or, or crack rock. <laughs> so he looked at them and he said, Hey, can you help a brother? Can you share a little bit? And he sticks his cup out to them and he and expects them to give him something. He expect, he, he was just hey, hey, hey I, he probably wasn't even paying attention to them. Alms, alms, yeah. If you got a, can you spare, brother, can you spare a quarter? Do you have an extra 50 cents? Notice verse 4. Peter looked straight at him. As did John. Then Peter said to him, hey, look at me. 
Look at us. So the man gave them his attention expecting to get some money. Expecting them to give him some coins and something where he could maybe sustain himself. He looked expecting them to give coins, money. And when he saw Peter and John, he saw Peter and John, but Peter and John saw him. You see, when they looked at him intently, I love that word. It didn't say they just glanced and go, oh, there's a, there's a lame guy. No, it says they turned, they focused, they intently, they saw him. They didn't see his cup, they didn't see his lameness, they saw him. And Peter said, only then did Peter say, now you look at us. Now as we read this, we know that this man, all he knew to ask for was money. He had no idea. Through all these years through the church and the people of this church who have reached out to this community, there are so many people who have said, if you can help me, help me. And I'm so glad to know that we can help them, not with something we have, but something he gives us. Amen. Who's seen Peter. It was all he expected. Unfortunately, there are many people who are walking the streets of this city who are bumping shoulders with you every day and they long to be free. They are maimed and lamed by sin, but because we are not being who we should be, they stay in that state. But if God can begin to touch us, that can change. And they're looking to the church and unfortunately all they know is I can get a piece of bread or a bowl of soup and they don't understand that if we can get this they can get Jesus and they can be free and they can be delivered and they can be empowered. They can be changed and transformed. Sorry if I get excited but this is what excites me. Then Peter said silver and gold I don't actually have that. But what I have, I will give you. But what I have. Guys, it doesn't matter how much money we could give you. The last thing you want to give a raging drug addict is, is more money. Because anybody that knows anything about a raging drug addict, the more money you have, the more drugs you will do. So the last thing they need is more money. But here he said, but there's something I'm going to give you, something different. And notice with me in verses 6 through 10. Then Peter said, silver, gold, I don't have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk. How about, how about you be healed from your lameness so that you can go and work and make your own living? Well, he kind of piqued this man's attention. You do know I've been lame from birth. I'm out here every day. You do know I can't walk, right? But notice what it says. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. Now, that's a whole other sermon. I could preach another half hour on that one. But I'm not. Y'all relax. <laughs> he began to help him up. And friends, I believe, we've preached about this. Even Lazarus, when he came out of the tomb, was still bound up in the grave clothes. And Jesus said, would somebody go up there and help him get out of those grave clothes? Even though he's been raised from the dead, his death has still got him bound up. And he's coming out of the tomb. You need to help him get out of that stuff. And sometimes they need a hand from someone of God lifting them up to where Jesus Christ means for them to be. Instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped up to his feet and began to walk. Any one of you who knows someone who's been lame their whole life or for years, you know what that does, how the body contorts and twists and the tendons all draw up and atrophy and everything else happens. There is no way outside of a divine miracle of God they're going to just get up and start walking. But this man says... He took him by the right hand and then he went with them into the temple courts walking and jumping. And in some texts it says leaping 
and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And here's the interesting part. The religious leaders, when they were confronted with this, said, well, it must not be that guy because he's lame. And see, the world looks around and says it can't possibly be God because there is no God, so God can't heal him. And people say, no, y'all are just crazy, and this religious stuff is insane because there is no God. Well, there's one problem. They say that because they don't believe there is a God. Because let me let you in on a secret. Just because you don't believe he is doesn't mean he ain't. He is whether you believe that he is or not. And it is only when we walk in it. (laughs) So notice what happens. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. And when Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Folks, I want us to get... I really want to see a day and a time where miracles are happening in our place and we're not shocked by it. As a matter of fact, we expect it to happen. It's not a surprise. I mean, I'm excited that someone is healed from cancer. I'm excited about it, but I should not be surprised by it. Because God is still in the healing business. God is still the God of of the universe. He still speaks and it happens. They were amazed. And they said, why are you looking at us? Why do you stare at us as if by our power, our godliness, we have made this man walk? Understand something. Our greatness won't save anybody. Our greatness won't heal anyone. I, you know, who, who we are as a church is our location and our facilities and all that. That is nothing. It's the power of God that transforms. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see, And no was made strong. It is Jesus' name and in faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him as you can all see. And then the religious leaders are like, what are we going to do with these men? Everybody living in Jerusalem knows that they have done an outstanding miracle and we can't deny it. You see, I want to see God begin to move so powerfully through his church that the world is scrambling around, freaking out with their house hair on fire, wondering, what are we going to do? These people are saying there's a God and they're doing all these miracles and all this stuff is happening. How can, you know, what are we going to do? Because we say you can't do that and they just keep doing it. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows that they have done an outstanding miracle and we cannot deny it. Oh, God can't do that. Well, he seems to have done this. The man's standing right here. But to stop this thing from speaking any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in in this name. And friends, let me tell you, our society is telling us to shut up. Shut up talking about this God. Shut up talking about this Jesus. Shut up talking about all of this. We don't want to hear all that. Well, guess what? I don't care whether you want to hear it or not. I can't help but talk about what I've seen and heard. I can't help but share about my Jesus Christ because I was lame and now I'm walking. I was blind, but now I see. I couldn't hear and I was deaf, but now I hear because I'm telling you I was dead and now I'm alive. He said, man, we can't help but share what's going on. After further threats, They let them go and they could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. I love that. I love that because you know what? We've got drug addicts that have been drug addicts for 20, 30 years and they say it's hopeless, just give it up. It's not happening. They're just going to die in their drugs. But hallelujah, guys, that ain't true, is it? That's not true. That's not true. Because God can still change a sinner no matter what his age, no matter how long he's been in it, no matter how long he's been lame, God can cause him to walk. But friends, it's when we begin to see them. You see, there's my title. Look before they leap. 
We've got to let God begin to open our eyes. We've got to, we, we have to let God begin to move us to where we see the hurting. We see the lost and it breaks our heart. Before we are moved to call them to look on us, however, we must allow God to turn our gaze upon them. May God move our eyes from their extended cup to the soul of the hand outreached toward us. Peter didn't see his cup. He saw him. He looked past his cup. Just like this church has looked past men's addictions and said there's a soul in there that cries to be free and we have the answer and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, there are divine appointments and encounters waiting for those who will allow the Holy Spirit to move upon them in such a way that they recognize those encounters and then empowered with what has been given them are comfortable to say, look on us. You see, a lot of churches are afraid to say, come to our church because God can do something powerful for you there because He's not doing anything powerful and they're afraid to say that He will because they haven't seen Him do it in so long. You see, they didn't say, well, we can't help but share what we were told that we have to share because that's our responsibility. Is that what they said? Does anybody remember what they said? We can't help but share what we have seen and heard. You see, he didn't just tell us. Uh, he did it. And there are some who will stand and preach a gospel and say, Jesus Christ can change a life and transform it. I haven't ever really seen it. and I've never seen it happen. It hadn't happened here in years. But I know that it can happen. No. I know it can happen. Matter of fact, I saw it this morning. I saw it last week. I saw it the week before that. I see it every day because I see what God does. You see, when it's right there before you and you see it every day, you can't deny it. And every day, I'm convinced that this man would come back through the temple and say, Hey, you non-believers, still walking. You know that Jesus you guys said couldn't heal me? I believe he did. Matter of fact, I feel the praise coming on. I think I'll just dance a little bit. I think I'll just run around in the temple a little bit. I think I'll just shout and praise God a little bit. Now, woo, because these old legs. I used to lay around down there in front of y'all and you walk by me every day, but somebody told me about the name of Jesus. Now, woo, look at here. I'm jumping and I'm running. Somebody get excited about Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give him some praise. Give him some praise right now. <laughs> he is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. Glory to the name of Jesus. <laughs> Before Peter and John saw a miracle running and leaping in the temple, they saw a lame man, not his cup, as their mission that day. The presence of the Holy Spirit was moving on them, then in them, and ultimately through them. <coughs> when He can focus your vision, He can define your mission. You have to look before they leap. You see, God has come to empower us to do what He has called us to do. But for some of us, we're not looking where we need to be looking for Him to show us what He has for us to do. You see, Jesus one day, and I close with this, Jesus one day is at the at the well getting some water and this lady walks up and he says would you get me some water she looks at him and he says why are you talking to me I'm a Samaritan you're a Jew I'd like some water that's why yeah but you Jews don't talk to us Samaritans remember brother Dave when you were downtown that one night and the guy goes why do you even care why are you down here and Dave looked at him and he says because I was you I was you. I was, I, I, I was homeless. I was lost. Brother Kevin walks up and down these streets and ministers to people. And they say, why do you care? He said, because I was there. I was who you are and what you are. But I'm changed and I'm transformed in the name of Jesus Christ. You see, when God begins to open our eyes and we see and we realize that God has given us power to complete 
When he can focus your vision, he can define your mission. But you have to look before they leave. God's got to begin to break your heart over stuff. God's got to begin to move your spirit. God's begin to show you things that somebody, something needs to be done about it. And then suddenly it'll dawn upon you, God has given me the power to do something about it. You see, I believe we become God's empowered people to do things that God desires to do. He doesn't ask me to do miracles. He asks me to allow Him to do miracles through me. Next Sunday is going to be Pentecost Sunday. I ask many of you to fast and pray and believe that God will pour out His Spirit. I believe God is going to begin to open our eyes to the fact that there are people we walk by every single day and have for years, but suddenly something's going to change. Something's going to happen. You're going to hear them say something. You're going to see something happen. And then suddenly, in that moment, the Holy Spirit is going to stop you and freeze you in your tracks and spin you around and cause you to look at that person and recognize that that person is your mission that day. That person is the one that Jesus wants to heal. That person is the one that Jesus wants to set free. And He wants to do it through you. But you can't give what you don't have. You can't give what you don't have. You see, here's the thing. I'm setting this up for next Sunday. I'm praying with all of my heart that this week God will break your heart over something. God will tear you up inside over someone or something that you've seen happen in people's lives or around you. Things that you may have seen every day, but for some reason, this week is different. They saw Him day after day after day when they went in the temple, but that day was a divine appointment. That day, God calls them to see Him in a new way. They saw not a beggar, but who He could be in Christ Jesus. They saw Him by faith, walking and leaping and praising God in the temple and said, I have some I want to give you. Then Jesus calls me to look on you in that name, that name above every other name, that name that I worship, that name that changed me. He's going to change you today. Hallelujah. God is still in the miracle working business today. But you don't have the power in yourself. I don't care how much you care. I don't care how much you love, how much you, how, how your heart is broken and all that. I know all of that and I've had to come to this realization. No matter how hard I'm willing to work, no matter what I'm willing to do, no matter what I'm willing to sacrifice, I can't heal you. I can't change you. I can't transform you. I can't do it. But if I will allow the one who can... To have his way in me. He can. He can. The Azusa Street Revival that happened in Los Angeles. Missionaries came from all over the world. And they fueled the flames of that great revival. You know why? Because they heard that there was an anointing and power that could be given to them to do what they were doing. They were failing at it. They were, they, they, were, they were failing miserably and they weren't being able to conquer the powers of darkness where they were. But they came to L.A. They came to that revival and God anointed them with His Holy Spirit. And they went back and from that day to this, in these last hundred years, more people have been saved and given their life to Christ than all of history previous. Why? Because something changed. The Holy Spirit came alive within His church, became alive within those missionaries. And suddenly what they could not do, He could. And they went back with the power and the anointing of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So I'll tell you what, I, I got supercharged this week, okay? Because God just keeps reminding me he knows what he's doing. I'm Pentecostal to the bone, okay? I'm dyed in the wool Pentecostal. But let me tell you why. <laughs> Not because I heard it. I've seen it. I haven't just heard it. I've seen it. I've seen it in the men at Mercy House. I've seen it through other people here in this church. I've seen it on the streets. I've seen it through my whole life. I've seen God do the miraculous. He's still a miracle working God. But you've got to look 
before they leap. You see, the problem is we've made it all about us. Why do I come to church? Why do I worship God? Why do I want the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Well, because it feels good and it's kind of fun and I enjoy it and everything else. And, and, and we made it all about us. But when you'll let Him move you from all about you to all about Him and all about His calling and His mission and His purpose in your life, something happens. Suddenly you recognize all of your inadequacies and no matter, listen to me very carefully there, some of you are very comfortable in where you are and how you're living your life in Christ right now. Well, la di da isn't that wonderful? There's a world going to hell out there. Pastor, I'm offended. I hope so. My dad told me a long time ago, he said, Son, it's your die, it's your job to comfort the comfortless and make discomfortable those who are comfortable. We've become comfortable. And maybe you have everything you need, but I'll guarantee you there's someone sitting on a pew not far from you right now. They don't have what they need. They're still lame and maimed and broken and shattered. And they're holding out a cup asking for whatever you might be able to give them. And you don't have much. And, and we can have all kinds of programs and social things. And, and we can feed and we have a pantry and we do all those things. But the lame man really would like to walk. The depressed person would like to be set free and swap in that mourning. That sorrow and mourning for joy. Lord Jesus, I come before you this morning and I ask you, God, will you cause us to look upon the lost? Will you cause us to look upon the mission field? And Jesus, that day as he was speaking with that woman at the well, he led her into a belief in him and then suddenly she brought all of her friends and I can only imagine what kind of friends she must have had. And Jesus said to his disciples, you see those people coming right there, there's the harvest field. But it started right here at this well with me talking to a lady, looking beyond the fact that she was a Samaritan, looking beyond the fact that she was immoral and was living with a fifth man who wasn't even her husband. And I looked past that and I saw her and I saw her in my love and my compassion and my grace. And now she's changed and she's bringing her friends and friends, that's when revival will hit us. And then we'll look up and say, the harvest field is white under heart. You've got to look before they leap. God had to teach them for 40 days about his mission and about his calling and about his kingdom. And he had to make it plain to them, I don't have another plan. It's you going to the world and telling them about me. Would you start that music?